Valentine's Day. Day of love, day of romance, the day when the card stores and the jewelry stores and the special chocolate stores and the forest all make a huge profit. In fact, I found this cartoon here. I kind of took it off the internet so don't show attention. So here's a, just a regular guy walking by, dozen roses, $15.99. And then the sign goes up and says, Valentine's special, dozen roses, $59.99. <laughs> right? That's what it feels like. But you know what? Actually, Valentine's Day has become kind of a cool holiday. Because it's a day to tell the people in your life that you love them. It's no longer just a day for lovers. It's a day for everyone to wish everyone a happy Valentine's Day. Friends, families, pets, co-workers, teachers, ministers. <laughs> so turn to somebody and say happy Valentine's Day. <laughs> Thank you, Tom. <laughs> you know, it's become this international day of love, which is certainly a lovely energy to be giving out into the world without question. And if you're single, all the hoopla around Valentine's Day can get you to feeling a little sorry for yourself. So several years ago, what I did as a self-respecting single woman, what I did on Valentine's Day was run away from home. You think I'm kidding, but I'm actually not. I treated myself to a couple of days in the desert, which is one of the places that I go to remember, remember, become one with, remember who I am. And I purposely planned it so that I would spend Valentine's Day alone in nature, falling in love with God again, to be truly one with the divine. Because isn't that how we describe being in love, romantic love, is that we want to be one with the person that we're in love with. So for this particular trip, it was several years ago, that's what I wanted to do. I wanted, I wanted to fall in love again, but not with another person necessarily, but with spirit, with my higher self. I wanted to feel whole again. Everybody go like this. <clears throat> the great poet, Sufi poet Hafiz, wrote many poems about love. Many, many poems about love. He wrote one that said, uh, because the one I love lives inside of you, I lean into you as close as I can be. I love that. But here's another one. It perfectly illustrates what I'm talking about. He said, like two lovers, who have been lost in a winter blizzard and find a cozy, empty hut in the forest. I now huddle everywhere with the friend. You see, friend is capitalized, so he means the divine there. I huddle now everywhere with the friend. God and I have built an immense fire together. We keep each other happy and warm. I love that. And Ernest Holmes talks about it too. He says, God is in and through all life. It is a complete unity. Our lives are rooted in this unity. And our relationship to it is instantaneous and mutual. Meaning that the same love that we feel for the divine is the same love that the divine energy, that love energy, feels for us. It is instantaneous and mutual. So it was with this in mind that uh, on that Valentine's weekend that I took off for Joshua Tree National Park. Anybody ever been to Joshua Tree National Park? One of my favorite places in the whole entire world. I was born there. I was, well, not in the park, but I was born in that part of the desert in California, so it, it, it's my heart place. It is where I go to remember, and, and as always, I'm there, and it's February 14th, and I'm struck by all the natural, stark beauty that's Joshua Tree, but in, 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 in addition to enjoying all of the sights, what happened was I kept 
thinking. I am part of this. And this is part of me. It's all God. So that means that the rocks and the trees and the skies and the mountains, we're all part of the same thing. We all come from the same essence. And it's usually what happens for me when I spend time in nature is that I felt those fragmented parts of me starting to come together again. <clears throat> Began to feel whole again. Even as I was running away from home on Valentine's Day. And what was even cooler, this is a true, honest-to-God story, as if by affirmation of my intention to feel whole again, I kept finding things that were shaped like hearts. I found a heart-shaped rock. I found a heart-shaped piece of glass, not like an owie piece of glass, but like one had been uh, worn down. I even, <laughs> I even found a heart-shaped smudge of mud. Honest to God. And I was like, okay, I get it. It's all about love. I get it. Which reminds me of another sweet story. I have several stories for you today. There's a group of kids, and they were asked a question. What does love mean? Rebecca, age eight, said, when my grandmother got arthritis, she couldn't bend over and paint her toenails anymore. So my grandfather does it for her all the time, even when his hands got arthritis too. That's love. And Chrissy, age six, love is when you go out and eat, when you go out to eat and give somebody most of your french fries without making them give any of yours. <laughs> Danny, age six, love is when my mommy makes coffee for my daddy and she takes a sip before giving it to him to make sure it tastes okay. <laughs> Carl, age five, I think he had the right idea. Love is when a girl puts on perfume and a boy puts on shaving cologne and they go out and smell each other. <laughs> jargon, uh, you could see their eyes would glaze over and they would look at me like I was crazy, right? So here's how I began explaining it to you. So we've got several people who are new. Uh, this is how I would explain it to you. I'm learning that God, and you understand when I use the word God, God, the, it works for me. That name works for me. But I'm not talking about the guy up in the sky. You understand? I'm talking about that life force energy, infinite intelligence, the creativeness of life itself, the universe. You can call it whatever you want. The word God just happens to work for me. So anyway, I'm learning that God, whatever you call it, is all there is. And that means that it is within me and it is within you. So the best way that I can honor God is to honor myself. If I dishonor myself, I am dishonoring the divine. So of course, some people still looked at me like it was crazy, but some people got it. They were like, oh, you know what? I actually have always believed that. You mean there's a whole group of people that think the same way I do? That's probably kind of nice. Because what the truth is that underneath all of the mistaken ideas that we have about ourselves, beliefs in, in lack and limitation and not being enough and undeservingness and self-doubt and self-recrimination, all that is left underneath all that is our pure divine self. 
And so part of becoming whole again is to fall in love with ourselves. Unconditionally loving ourselves. Not when we lose the weight and get the great job and win the lottery and raise the kids and find the mate and buy the house and, or get enlightenment right now. Unconditionally loving ourselves. Because enlightenment comes when we fall in love with ourselves. Because we are falling in love with the beloved. Take that in. When we fall in love with ourselves, we are falling in love with the blood. So there's a beautiful teaching story. You may have heard it before. I, I personally think it's a wonderful story. It's very illustrative. And it's a story about a monastery that has fallen upon hard times. It was once a great monastery, a great order, but in time, there were only five monks who were left. The abbot and four older monks, all age 70 or above. So what had been a, 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 a very uh, vital order became a dying order. And in the woods near where the monastery was, there was a little hut that a rabbi from a neighboring town would come and use for meditation and retreat. So for some reason, it occurred to the abbot of the monastery that maybe he would go visit the rabbi and see if the rabbi had any, any advice for him. So the, the, he goes and knocks on the door, and the rabbi welcomes him in. Oh, it's so wonderful to see you. And when the abbot explained the reason for his visit, the rabbi said, you know, I know how it is. It's the same way in my town, too. The spirit's gone out of people. He said, nobody comes to temple anymore. And so the old abbot and the old rabbi wept together because they, they loved their, who they were and they loved God so much and they weren't able to share it. Well, then they read parts of the Torah and they read the Bible and they shared, they, they spoke of deep things. And then it was time for the abbot to go home and they embraced. And the abbot said, it's so wonderful to meet you after all these years, but I failed in my purpose from why I came here. Is there nothing you can tell me that would help me save my dying order? And Robert said, no, I'm sorry. I, I have no advice to give you. But I can tell you this. The Messiah is one of you. Well, the abbot returned back to the monastery, and the monks are like asking, what's going on, what's going on, what's the rabbi say? And, and he said, the rabbi said something very strange, very mysterious. He said that the Messiah is one of us. And I don't know what he meant by that. So in the time that followed, the old monks were thinking about the rabbi's word. The Messiah is one of us? Could he mean one of us monks? If so, which one? Do you suppose he meant the abbot? Yeah, you know, if he meant anybody, he meant the abbot. I mean, he's been our leader for more than a generation. On the other hand, maybe he meant Brother Thomas. Certainly, Brother Thomas is a holy man. He's a man of light. He couldn't have meant Brother Edward. Edward gets crotchety all the time. But come to think of it, even though he's a thorn in people's sides, when you look back, Edward is virtually always right. Maybe the rabbi meant Edward. Surely couldn't mean Brother Philip. Philip is so passive, he's a real nobody. But then, almost mysteriously, he has a gift for always being there when you need him. He just magically appears. Maybe Brother Philip is the Messiah. And then they got to thinking, of course, the rabbi didn't mean me. He couldn't possibly have meant me. I'm just an ordinary person. Yet suppose he did. Suppose I'm the Messiah. Oh, God, not me. Don't let me be that important. But as they contemplated this, the old monks began treating each other 
with extraordinary respect on the slight chance that the one among them might be the Messiah. Most importantly, they began to treat themselves with extraordinary respect. So the grounds around the monastery were very beautiful, and occasionally people would come and they would have picnics there, and walk and go into the chapel to meditate. And as they did, they started noticing, started to be conscious that they sensed this aura of extraordinary respect that was, was, was surrounding the old monks. It was it radiated from them and it permeated the atmosphere of the place. There was something strangely attractive, even compelling, about it. Hardly knowing why, the people began to come back to the monastery more frequently. And they began to bring their friends to show them this special place. And the friends brought friends. And then it happened that some of the younger men came to visit the monastery and started to talk to more and more of the old monks. And after a while, one asked if he could join. And then another. And then another. And within just a few years, the monastery had gone from a dying order to once again being a thriving order. And thanks to the rabbi's gift, the Messiah is one of you. And the idea of treating each other and, and themselves with this respect, the monastery became a vibrant center of light and spirituality throughout the land. So I'm not saying that one of you is the Messiah. What I am saying is that each of you has the makings of the Messiah. Each one of you has the spark of the divine within you. And there is absolutely nothing you can do to make that spark, that spark be extinguished. It is who and what you are. So if you are to love God, you must start by loving yourself. So we're going to have a ceremony right now that's going to affirm just that. So Mark, if you would come up and play a little music, that would be lovely. I'm going to invite you to take anything off your laps, set down your glasses or anything like that. Dearly beloved, we are here in the presence of God and each other to commit ourselves to the highest form of love there is, the love of our higher or divine selves. We do this because we know that everything we need in life, all the love, all the wisdom, all the insight, all the power, all the knowledge, all the understanding, all the nurturing, all the compassion, and all the strength resides within us as us. So I invite you now to please take a hold of your own hand. Please do it. By doing so, you're taking the hand of God in consciousness. I'm going to ask you a series of questions, and I think you know the answer. Do you choose this divine self to be your companion? to live together in peace and love? Will you respect yourself, honor yourself, and keep sacred the integrity of your soul? Say, I do. Do you now commit your love to your higher self, whose hand you are now holding? Say, I do. 
Will you live with this divine self in a state of true harmony? Say, I will. Will you love yourself, recognize your individuality, comfort yourself, honor yourself at all times, and give yourself the highest of yourself? Say, I will. Will you commit to be open, honest, and loving throughout all the changes of your life? Say, I will. And now repeat after me. I, and say your name, don't be smart, Alec. Ask you, my higher self, to be my partner, my lover, my friend, and my conscious, my continuous companion, and my continuous companion. I give you now my deepest friendship and love. I promise to see the light of divinity around you. And always seek to share the light of divinity with you. Okay, now I'm going to speak. You don't need to repeat. Inasmuch as you have consented together in this commitment to your higher being and witness the same before everyone present, and recognizing the authority vested in me by the state of high consciousness, it is now my joy and pleasure to pronounce you committed to the best. Happy Valentine's Day. I love you. And so it is. So it is.